Well, and I'm sure that you lead not only in the library, but probably in your community venues and with your family or if you're involved in any organizations outside of the library. So we're going to get started. And what I have here is I uh, hope to go over is the Servant Leadership Toolkit. This is to build awareness about servant leadership, uh, to enhance your leadership skills, to grow and cultivate aspiring and potential leaders, um, and promote coaching and mentoring. Um, the, I'm delighted to present this because, as I said, leadership is a, a topic that I certainly like to discuss. However, in my leadership journey, um, being a manager and moving into management where you're making sure the work gets done, but then uh, I had to realize that how do I impact people? How do I influence people? So I'll share a little bit from uh, my personal um, leadership journey. Uh, we'll define a leadership. And then the uh, attributes of leadership, I'll, I'll list those. And then we'll go from there. And I will apply some of those attributes uh, the, the experience that I have applying these attributes, and then we'll have time uh, for questions and, uh, questions and comments. All right. What is servant leadership? Robert Greenleaf, the originator of the term servant leadership, is someone who thought and wrote a great deal about the nature of servant leadership and character. The servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. The best test is, do those serve grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? So that is servant leadership in a nutshell. It's looking at character. It's looking at cre credibility. And when you're in a leadership position, followers need to know, can they trust you? And it's it's a difference between management, as you know, and leadership. Management makes sure that the work gets done, there are processes. But leadership, um, that's when you're influencing people, impacting people for the better. Uh, I like to think of it as managing is doing things right, while leadership is doing the right things, is having that moral compass. In 2005, I attended, I was uh, fortunate to attend uh, a servant leadership held in Indianapolis. Um, and it was there, uh, I had been searching for some type of leadership style. I had learned all of the basics of how to manage, learning about HR, uh, your performance evaluations, what forms to do if you have a person that uh, uh, needs to improve, employee improvement plans, uh, even to the point where you, know, you have to fire someone or you have to move someone or transfer someone. But my inner self was thinking, how do I do this in a positive way where uh, uh, it, it impacts or it really helps the person to see where they need to grow? Or how can I do it in such a way where they feel like they uh, have some dignity? And I think part of this, and what I'll talk about a little bit later, is I have an Afrocentric view point. Um, and I, growing up, it was always looking at how you can serve the other person. And I think I had that uh, ingrained in me in my family, also in the uh, community organizations I was involved in, the sororities, the churches. And just seeing it uh, uh, um, done and modeled by some of my um, uh, uh, family members who were entrepreneurs or who had positions, and they always made that person feel special or made, get, gave them some dignity. So that is something that we'll look at and talk about later. But as we are in libraries, you think about customer service. What can we do for the customer first? All right. 
So we have the servant leadership style, discovery of self, a strong desire to serve others, and a commitment to lead. And before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about some other uh, leadership styles, such as laissez-faire. And I kind of uh, go uh, back and forth with using some of these leadership styles. Um, but the one I really uh, uh, i am a proponent of is servant leadership. But laissez-faire, uh, the behaviors are, you know, is your leader, you know what is happening, but you're not in, uh, directly involved in it. Uh, I tend to be a laissez-faire uh, director. Well, I uh, talk with my people, I meet with them regularly, but I'm not involved in their particular areas, such as technical services or reference or instruction. Um, I trust others to keep their word. Um, Laissez-faire also monitors performance and gives feedback regularly. Um, a good time to use it is when the team is working in multiple locations or remotely, and that tends to be more and more. We're seeing more and more of people at different sites uh, away from the main company, or in, as my experience is the main campus, and we have over 22 sites in Indiana and also in Illinois and a uh, site in Kentucky. So how do you, how, how do you uh, lead a person who you may never see, you just speak to over the phone or a webinar or over the computer through email? Also, uh, when a project under multiple leaders must come together by a specific date and you need to get quick results from a highly cohesive team. So the impact on others, it really works, is very effective when the team is skilled, when they're experienced, when they're self-directed in use of time and resources. And the autonomy of the team members leads to high job satisfaction and hopefully increase productivity. So that is the laissez fair. Any questions so far? No, no. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Then we have transformational leadership. Transformational um, behaviors expects the team to transform even when it's uncomfortable. You'll be asked to stretch. It counts on everyone giving their best. It serves as a role model for all involved. And when to use it. You want to use it to encourage the group to pursue action, innovative action, and to think creatively. And I think we spend so much time getting the work done that we don't have time to think creatively, get that out of the box um, um, uh, thinking, so to speak. And also in transformational leadership, is to motivate the group by strengthening team optimism, enthusiasm, and commitment. Its impact on others is, once again, it can lead also lead to high productivity and engagement from all the team members. And the but the team really needs a detail-oriented person to ensure that the scheduled work is done. We can spend a lot of time, and some teams I've been involved in, it's been fun to get the work done because we're using different uh, strengths. Everyone has different strengths. And um, we, uh, with transformational, you are trying to really transform your institution, but also transform others. And I've seen this work with people, even if you want to, you're looking at people to promote or people are seeking to uh, move up the managerial level. Uh, a ladder. And then we have the autocratic, which many of us have uh, probably had much experiences with an autocratic um, uh, leadership style. And this is where um, the person is more like a manager. I'll tell you what to do, and you do it. Um, the impact on others, it can be, uh, the impact I've had, it can be a negative. Um, also, it's, it's more of following the company line. And I know we all have to adhere to various uh, policies and procedures. But sometimes when you want that out-of-the-box thinking, and then thinking of some of the, um, the uh, 
uh, uh, people that are new to library uh, science or library work, uh, we want to get their ideas as well. So sometimes an autocratic uh, leadership style will squelch that cre creativity and not open that communication, which we'll talk about later. Autocratic is sometimes done. You really need it at times, and I, I really I, I use it, but it's about command and control. Um, and sometimes you need to go and use it. Very, very seldom do I have to use it. Uh, but you follow the rules. You expect others to do the same. You can use it when there's a real urgency with no time for discussion, when safety is at stake. Um, it demands immediate compliance and is the sole, that, that person, that leader, is the sole decision maker. Now, if used too much, it feels restrictive and it limits others' ability to develop their own leadership skills, and others have little chance to debrief, debrief what was learned before the next encounter with that leader. So those are some of the other styles, and there are many others, um, but the servant leadership style is one where you really know yourself, and you know yourself, and you have a strong desire to serve others, and you have a commitment to lead. All right, here is the servant leadership model. And this is, um, actually when it started off, there were 10, and now there are 12. Um, number one is listening, then empathy, healing, awareness, persuasion, conceptualization, foresight, stewardship, growth, building community, calling and nurturing the spirit and having joy. Now some of this may seem uh, a little bit touchy-feely for many of us, but as I said, it is a moral compass and uh, you may feel uncomfortable with this. Um, also, uh, there is another leadership style, such as emotional intelligence, which when I did uh, pre preparing for this presentation, this is somewhat similar to servant leadership. However, servant leadership in most leadership manuals or books, what I've done in, in the research, is more of an ethical um, leadership style than a quantitative or qualitative style such as your autocratic or your emotional intelligence. So what I'm going to do now is go through each of the servant leadership models and give you a definition. Listening. Leaders have traditionally, traditionally been valued for their communication and decision making skills. Although these are also important skills for the servant leader, they need to be in reinforced by a deep commitment to listening intently to others. The servant leader seeks to identify the will of the group and helps to clarify that will. He or she listens receptively to what is being said and unsaid. Listening also encompasses getting in touch with one's own inner voice. Listening coupled with periods of reflection are essential to the growth and well-being of the servant leadership. Quick question. Uh, yes. Real quick. Somebody said, what was the name of the emotional style? Uh, e uh, emotional intelligence. And I believe Goldman is the author. G-O-L-M-A-N. There's a lot of material out on that. Emotional intelligence. Uh, highly used in uh, your corporate America setting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've talked about communication inner voice, and reflection. Now we go to empathy. We could all use some empathy. <laughs> the servant leader strives to understand and empathize with others. People need to be accepted and recognized for their special and unique spirits. One assumes the good intentions of coworkers and colleagues and does not reject them as people, even when one may be forced to refuse to accept certain behaviors or performance. The most successful servant leaders are those who have become skilled, empathetic listeners. So you're inclusive, you're relational, and you try to understand. Can you elaborate a little bit about relational okay. under empathy? 
under empathy, uh, you really want to, uh, even though these are your co-workers, you really want to establish a relationship with them. Um, when I, for instance, when I get new people on board, I sit down and talk with them um, just to find out what their goals are because everyone comes, they might want to learn a particular thing in the library or they want to move on or they might have aspirations of becoming a director. Also, working within the goals that we have, and I talk to them about their performance evaluation. So it really is uh, establishing that relationship and getting to know them because um, some people look at uh, our, 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 um, leaders or managers as I really can't talk with them. They're my manager. I really don't want to uh, uh, burden them with this or what if they reject me. So even uh, to the point where uh, while you're in the break room or uh, talking about what's going on in their lives, child may be graduating from high school or a family member may be uh, ill or with a long-term disease. So being relational, and I said it may be touchy-feely, but you get to know your people. And I think I work in a small setting and it's good to know what's going on with others so then you know when those times where they have to be out or what's going on. And I try to uh, not to share everything, but if that person is willing to share, I said, let's just think about your thoughts or prayers or with someone. So having the relationship, it might not, but some people don't um, want to be relational, and that's okay. They want to keep it as a uh, manager subordinate role, and that's fine too. But still knowing people... Uh, their uh, likes and dislikes and how they work, much like those of us that have children. Every child is different, and you want to communicate them in the best way that they can receive it. Does that answer the question? Yes, okay. All right. Now we'll get to healing. Healing. The healing of relationships is a powerful force for transformation and integration. One of the great strengths of servant leadership is the potential for healing oneself and one's relationship to others. Many people have broken spirits and have suffered from a variety of emotional hurts. Uh, you may have hired someone who had a poor uh, manager experience, and they're still thinking of that poor experience and thinking of you as, will this person be like the boss I had before? So... Um, you, you may have an opportunity to help make them whole. Um, and, and really, you want to search for wholeness. Because um, if they had a poor previous boss experience, you're going to deal with that residue. Or if they're coming from a different uh, department um, uh, and something happened there. So when you think about healing, you're looking at helping people uh, become whole. I'm not saying we should be counselors but in the guise of working in the library. And as I said, my experience, I've worked in large libraries. I've worked in, I'm currently working in a small uh, staff library. But even in a large library, I was responsible for several people under me. So, you know, talking with them and trying to, and if they have their goals and they express them, uh, help them to get to that point. Also self, being aware of self. Because when you move from manager to leadership and go back and forth, you have to be aware, be self-aware. Know what buttons <laughs> that can be pushed on you. Know uh, what things you don't tolerate, what things you can. So it's a part of knowing yourself as well and being trustworthy, being trustworthy. I think that's very important. Uh, um, that Can I trust you with information? Can I trust you to hear me out? Can I trust you? Um, to uh, listen to my ideas and be open. So that's part of healing. All right. Then we're going to move on to awareness. General awareness, especially self-awareness, it strengthens the servant leader. Awareness helps one in understanding issues involving ethics, power, and values. It lends itself to being able to view most situations for, from a more integrated holistic position. Able leaders are usually sharply awake and reasonably disturbed. They are not seekers after solace. They have their own inner serenity. And this is a quote from John Greenleaf. So when you look at awareness, authentic, you're being your authentic self. Then we move on to persuasion. 
Another characteristic of servant leaders is reliance on persuasion rather than on one's positional authority in making decisions within an organization. The servant leader seeks to convince others rather than coerce or make them comply. And we all know when someone makes you do something, you're probably not going to get a good result. This particular element offers one of the clearest distinctions between the tra traditional uh, authoritarian model and that of servant leadership. The servant leader is effective at building consensus within groups. And as I mentioned before, uh, sometimes I do have to use that autocratic style when it's very important, but very seldom do I have to use that, especially if I have a team, because I want to build consensus. And there are some times where I cannot poll the group and I have to make that decision, but I come back to the team or to the group and say this is the decision I had to make and this is why. So I'm being transparent as well. And as, as librarians and working in the library field, it's so important. That's what we do. We persuade people. We tell our stories and I think we need to tell more and more of our stories. Effective consensus builder and then we move to, <coughs> excuse me, conceptualization. Excuse me while I take a sip of water here. Conceptualization. Servant leaders seek to nurture their abilities to dream great dreams. Now you probably wonder, dreaming dreams? I'm head of the circulation team. What am I going to dream about? But everyone has goals and desires. Maybe you dream about that new system. Maybe you dream about how we can uh, add a, another service, you know, that sort of thing. So it's, ability, it's the ability to look at a problem or an organization um, from a conceptualizing perspective means that one must think beyond the day-to-day -day realities. For many leaders, this is a characteristic that re, uh, requires discipline and practice. The traditional leader is consumed by the need to achieve short-term operational goals. The leader who wishes to also be a servant leader must stretch his or her thinking to encompass broader-based conceptual thinking. It's more about being a visionary. It's also about balance because servant leaders are called to seek a delicate balance between conceptual thinking and day-to-day -day operational approach. Imaginative, thinking outside of the box and visionary. Now we'll get to foresight. This is closely related to conceptualization. Foresight is a characteristic that enables the servant leader to understand the lessons from the past, the realities of the present, and the likely consequence of a decision for the future. It is also deeply rooted within the intuitive mind. Foresight remains a largely unexplored area in leadership studies, but one must be deserving of careful attention. So you're looking at competency, intuitiveness. Um, for those of you, I don't know, some of you may have uh, done your Myers-Briggs, the MBTI, um, and this comes and being intuitive is kind of knowing within, so to speak. Um, and I did do some research, and I'm going to do some more research on this foresight attribute of, of uh, servant leadership. Now we move to stewardship. Servant leadership, like stewardship, assumes first and foremost a commitment to serving the needs of others. It also emphasizes the use of openness and persuasion rather than control. So you're really transparent. You have a commitment to stewardship. Um, when you, Sometimes we think of stewardship as handling finances, and that's very important. So how we handle our uh, followers is very important. You have the commitment and you are open and transparent and responsible. Growth. One of the things that I like about ser servant leadership, and because I like to develop people and help them, I love to see them grow, is commitment to the growth of people. Servant leaders believe that people have an intrinsic value beyond their tangible contributions as workers. As such, the servant leader is deeply committed 
to the growth of each and every individual within his or her, her organization. The servant leader recognizes the tremendous responsibility to do everything in his or her power to nurture the personal and professional growth of employees and colleagues. In practice, this can include, but not be limited to, concrete actions, such as making funds available for personal and professional development, taking a personal interest in the ideas and suggestions from everyone, and encouraging worker involvement in decision making. All right. So that is growth. You want to empower people. We hear a lot about empowering people. And I, I really believe that being a servant leadership, helping people to grow. As a leader, uh, we can't do it all. We just can't have everything on our plate. Um, we're spinning wheels in one hand, pulling levers in another hand. Uh, um, our feet are doing so many other things. So we want to empower others so they can do the work as well. And nurturing. This may be a touchy-feely uh, term for some of us because we want to nurture people. We want to grow. And I think the Indiana State Library and some of the organizations, I'm hearing more and more uh, about mentoring and, and coming alongside someone who aspires, whether to be a director or who just wants to learn from a competent leader. So you have that shared leadership. Not One person is not doing everything. Okay. Building community. The servant leader senses that much has been lost in recent human history as a result of the shift from local communities to large institutions as the primary shaper of human lives. This awareness causes the servant leader to seek to identify some means for building community among those who work within a given institution. Servant leadership suggests that true community can be created among those who work in businesses and other institutions. It's about showing the way. Um, so when you're talking about building community, it's connectedness. And what better place than a library to connect? We connect to adults. We connect to seniors. We connect to children, to preschoolers. And we are connecting remotely to those people that are on social media, like us, uh, follow us on Instagram, uh, that sort of thing. So we're still connected. And I believe libraries do a very good job of building community. And this is very important. You create a sense of values. Um, when you're building community, we're learning from one another, learning from people different than we are. And then the two that were added was calling and joy. Calling. There's a calling on your life. You want to impact lives. And when I talk to librarians, I ask them, well, what got you interested in libraries? Well, some of us, it was a childhood dream. We love the library. It was a safe place. They like to read or they like to help people. So it really is a calling. And you want to make a difference in people's lives. And then nurturing the spirit, having that joy. It's good to go to work and you're feeling, OK, I'm going to impact someone today. I might have a few things that, uh, that might be challenging. But one of the things I like to do is the honest praise. At Indiana Tech, we have a tech salute where we can, uh, if someone has done a good job or you want to acknowledge them, we have a tech salute and they get a certificate uh, at the end of the month. We also do tech salutes for our student workers as well. So honest praise and supportive recognition. And sometimes it's not just a, uh, sometimes we can't give out monies, but it's, it's being uh, acknowledged people in front of their peers, uh, saying a big thank you. Or it might be a, a batch of brownies and sharing them with, with people. So we want to do honest praise, supportive recognition. So how do we, and I've talked about the, this before, uh, how do we apply servant leadership in academic, public, school, and organizations? It's about customer service. How do we do it with the staff? How do we uh, serve our team members and also our stakeholders? So I'm going to go through the attributes, but have some applications here uh, that this is part of my leadership journey. Effective communication, feeling, and thinking, and people, and projects. 
Effective communication is important, as we talked with, about earlier. Um, we're looking at um, what is said and unsaid. Excuse me, trying to follow my notes here. Um, I practice servant leadership as effective communication, is having regular meetings. That might not work at your workplace, uh, but sometimes I have staff many huddles where we might stand up. And it might be an issue such as we're shifting some things in the collection and we might just go through uh, the library and have a stand up meeting and just have a mini, mini huddle to discuss what different ideas, find out different ideas of ways that we can do a project. Um, also, um, I have an open door policy. Um, I meet with my staff um, individually once a month. We have a one one on one meeting, and then once a week, because I have a small staff, or uh, we meet in a mini huddle. And sometimes that involves my higher up, the vice president of academic affairs. He joins us at least once a month to hear what the library is doing. So effective communication up and down the 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 uh, uh, the workplace. Also, when I have these meetings. Sometimes, and I am an INTJ, I put it out there, an I, a, a MBTI, and I think a lot. But I have to remember that I may have to uh, ask my staff members, well, how do you feel about this? So that's part of that servant leader talking in their language. How do they write? Because I say, I think we should do this, this, but how do you feel about this? And sometimes that comes out as uh, solving a problem that it might be a people problem versus versus a, a process problem, because you're concerned about a, a, the, the uh, students we serve or the faculty members that we serve. And also, uh, you have to look at people and projects. What's the best for the person um, when you're dealing with a project? Because as, as managers slash leaders and servant leaders, we have to balance that out. Whether you, when you're working for people, what is the best, or what's the best process for this project? Because sometimes we get in an autocratic, and I've been under that command and control. You're so fixated on the project that you forget about the people. And that's when it's important that you have that positive recognition and, 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 and acknowledge them along the way. OK. Did I? OK. All right. We're going to awareness, persuasion, and conceptualization. Um, bottom line. Really, I talk with them uh, individually with my staff members. And they set out goals. Uh, when they come in uh, new to the library, and I've had th done this practice in previous places that I've worked, I have uh, sat down and give them a blank copy of a performance evaluation and gone over all the attributes. So I tell them the bottom line is this is what we're looking for. And then you can set up goals, whether if you're technical services and you want to catalog X amount of books or you want to work on a different project or you're in reference or instruction. Um, how many instruction sessions do you want per week? And also uh, performance uh, uh, I mean, uh, professional development. What things do you want to learn about? Uh, so I can at least uh, we can sit down and and see if you can go to ILF or some of the district meetings or attend a webinar through our consortiums and tell a good story. Also, being uh, able to lead and manage that balancing act of leading and managing. That is very important to me, and I do a lot of reflection in my office because there's a time to lead and then there's a time to manage. So that's very important as well um, for that. Um, some of the, I've encouraged some people to, uh, in their leadership and learning styles, to uh, consider an MBTI or a disc or a strength finder or give them books to read on self-awareness or leadership styles. Um, and then also um, uh, balancing, casting that vision 
and doing long range plans. As a leader, we're always looking ahead of uh, ahead down the line. We're looking. I might be. Uh, six months or a year ahead. In fact, I'm looking at the fall semester now <laughs> and preparing for things so we can work on our projects during the summer. Uh, but your subordinates or your followers may not realize that. So you want the, the, uh, them to be included and also learn their learning styles as well. Foresight, stewardship, and growth. Uh, some examples I have for that is that um, um, like I said, talk about long-term goals. I work in a self-managed work team where they are responsible for their areas. And as I said, on the one plus one meetings, that really is to make sure they're uh, moving towards their goals. And the staff meetings are them sharing out what they have done so other people get to hear what's going on and maybe Eureka there's an idea I can do this or we have a student that can do that for you especially in a small uh, setting so I I'm a proponent of the self-managed work team and if you google it I sorry I didn't have any information on that uh, but it's, it's used in business where everyone is responsible for their area uh, and Sometimes in, in, in the area such as in technical services, that one person may be the leader for that group and works with their uh, co-workers on different things. So they're managing within themselves. But we all come together um, making sure we're on the same page, same goals. And then, of course, being transparent. Being transparent is very important. People want a leader who they can trust, who is, uh, they can rely upon, and who's credible. All right, and building the community, calling, nurturing the spirit, joy. It's important to network. As we talk about st stakeholders, uh, as a librarian, we serve as an academic librarian. I serve uh, the faculty. I serve the staff. So it's important for me uh, sometimes to walk the halls and network with the different faculty. Uh, and they know I'm passionate about the library because I'm always asking, what can we do? What if they're getting a new curriculum? OK, how can we help you? Or uh, say, for instance, the psychology department, they went through uh, a, a, um, um, uh, lost my train of thought. They went through, uh, they wanted to add a master's level program. So I had to sit with them. I said, oh, you're thinking about, we, this was a talk before it was in the uh, official faculty senate meeting. I said, well, you're going to need some more resources and research. Uh, let me know what you need. We can sit down. I can meet with you. So networking, having that passion, and everyone, whether you're the CERT manager, you're the, uh, the director, you're a frontline person, we should have some fulfillment from my job. Being that servant leader, when I come home at, at night or driving home from work, I said, did I serve someone today and how well did I serve them? Um, that's the commitment that you have. And, and that makes you fulfilled as well. All right. These are our resources. Um, there are some other areas you can look at. Uh, the ALA Library and Management Association. Um, there's the... Um, site for that and the Center for Creative Leadership. Uh, I uh, really enjoy visiting these, the, this site because they have short articles and white papers on leadership. And this site is a very, very uh, 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 eff eff uh, uh, effective site to use if you're looking for things outside of the library. It just talks about leadership and, and in general. And then the Urban Libraries Council. Uh, they have interesting articles as well, and um, they work with museums. Many of you, are, I'm sure, are quite familiar with it. Uh, they work with libraries and museums. And some of the authors that uh, are proponents of servant leadership, which you are familiar with, Ken Blanchard, Stephen Covey, John Maxwell, uh, Larry Spears, who has written for the uh, John Greenleaf Center. And you can certainly go to that uh, website and find more information about that. Okay. And my references, I have a Servant Leadership. Uh, that's an article, A New Model for Law Library Leaders. 
uh, servant leadership in public libraries, and the book Leadership Theory and Practice, which is used at Indiana Tech. We have a uh, PhD program in global leadership where people can uh, obtain their uh, doctorate in academic leadership or um, um, uh, leadership in general. So we have that program, and I work uh, very closely with them. But this is the uh, book, sort of the, the textbook that they use. And uh, servant leadership is included, although they frame it as an ethical leadership style, not as a true leadership style. That okay. Very good book. It talks about culture and different things there. Okay. Um, so thank you. And I did forget. Uh, change that up. We did have one on culture. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about um, a cultural, I have an Afrocentric cultural view. Um, um, and I think this maybe com comes from my leadership journey, whereas the highest value of life lives in the interpersonal relationship be between humans. The survival of the group holds the utmost importance. Cooperation, collective responsibility, and interdependence are the key values to which all should strive to achieve. And the Afrocentric worldview is a circular one in which all events are tied together with one another, whereas uh, different from the Eurocentric view, where its survival of the fittest holds the utmost import importance. Um, change occurs to meet the immediate objectives, competition, Independence, separateness, and individual rights are the key values to which all should strive to achieve. So when I think my leadership, servant leadership journey has come from uh, my upbringing, has come from reading numerous managerial and leadership books, um, and also just practicing it in many of my organizations, not just the library, because servant leadership is we're here to help people. Uh, we're not a, a, a mat to walk upon when you talk about servant, um, but it's a positive where you are serving your people and you're showing them that you care. You care about their uh, professionalism. You, call, you care about them personally because it does affect our work. So I'd like to thank you for listening, and now I'll turn it over to Kim. Okay, so... Had a question here. Um, do you find yourself adjusting your leadership style depending on the person you're leading? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> That's why it's important to know your people, um, because one uh, may not work for another. There, are, there are some people that um, I may have to use the command and control. Okay. There are some that. Um, I see them maybe on the brink of becoming that leader or manager or moving up or moving away. I'm a very good trainer uh, in a small uh, academic library. I've trained several people to move out uh, to other uh, libraries, and I'm 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 very glad about that because I've I've helped to uh, uh, to develop some people, and I've had some feedback for some of those. Uh, directors and said, man, you trained them very well. So yes, absolutely. You do need to, uh, uh, long as you know what your dominant style is, but you know you, you have to go between co command and control. Yeah. We have a comment and a question. Uh, Judy's comment is that, so glad to hear you talk about creating a balance between leading and management. And then we have a question from Jane. She wants to know, what is command and control? Well, that's just a term. Uh, really, when we talked about the autocratic leadership style, uh, that's that manager. I think it came from the industrial age. I'll mention, a, um, use an example of my father worked in the steel mill. And they had a foreman. And what that foreman told them to do, that's what they did. There was no discussion of, I think about this. No, you've got to do this. So with command and control, you're commanding that that follower does this. And you're controlling the outcomes. And I think sometimes we miss out. But it, as I said, I mentioned earlier with the command and control, you have to know when to use it because it's very important that you may have to use it, uh, especially when you're dealing with some HR issues. 
and I have a very good relationship in all the places I've worked with with the human resources team um, to make sure that I'm complying with everything. And I have worked in a, a union um, uh, uh, library as well. So there were certain things you could and can, you could and could not do in those sit situations. And command and control, uh, you look at, at, at safety. You look at um, um, command, uh, uh, compliance. Um, it's really the top-down type management. Okay. I don't see any other typing in the chat box. Does anybody else have any questions or comments for Connie? See people typing. So somebody uh, says, so things like following policy might fall under command and control. Yes, yes. And it's good that you know that. It's very important that you know that. Um, and dealing with a person, and it might be that you're in a situation, we all have had those. Uh, um, um, co-workers or someone under us that is not performing well, but it's best to talk with them beforehand because that's why uh, people, new people coming in, they also talk with human resources and read the booklet and different things, and I encourage it as well. And then uh, I have an orientation where we go over the performance evaluation, the expectations. So um, yes, command and control. And you may have, you, we all have had, if you haven't already, you will meet that um, that employee is just difficult. And that's another session. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question uh, from Kyle. He wants to know, where did you get the quote related to Afro and Eurocentric? It's very nice. I am sorry, Kyle, if I get your information I had just written it down, and that's one of the things in my haste to get things done. <laughs> I did not write that down. So uh, you can certainly, why don't you email me, and uh, I can get that to you. Connie's email is listed here. It's uh, cescott at indianatech.edu. If you were to Google it, Kyle, I think you would... Um, use the term Afrocentric and European worldviews, and you may find some things there. Oh, sorry. Kyle is a she. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm Kyle. sorry Kyle. No, I said he, too. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, OK. Somebody says, as an employee or team member, if your superior does not see that his team are leaders, how do you continue to respect the leader? Um, that's a difficult one. Um, what that entails is communication. Um, I was all, always under the guise, and I've been in both situations, been a follower and, and a, a leader, a manager, and uh, that's difficult, and it's, it can be challenging. And that involves, like I said, some very specific communication. I uh, won't say that you need to get uh, human res resources involved, um, but you may want to sit down. That's when it comes in to really listening and have that emphatic listening. And that leader, it might be something that's going on with them personally or they're just like that, and you have to maybe adapt to that leadership style. And that's why it's important to know the various leadership styles. You can identify them. And then much like Myers-Briggs, we're all different types. Um, but you have to find out what, what works best. How can I communicate with an extrovert and an introvert? Uh, does that answer your question? That can be very challenging. But you have to respect the office, because some of us will be in that leadership position one day. And the balance may be on another side there. So it's very difficult. But you respect that leadership role, but also try to um, communicate. And if it doesn't work, sometime you may have to uh, find out some other options. Uh, Kimberly, uh, she said, it does help, but I believe it has to do with the culture 
of the institution. Yes, that's very important. I um, I am a sort of a square peg in a round hole uh, because I, I uh, am a servant leader proponent and people around me uh, are your kind of command or control and it's the bottom line. Um, however, on the flip side of that, when something really is needed and something needs to be talked about or discussed, I am included in those meetings because being a servant leadership is about having character, it's about being reliable, it's about being cre credible. And I believe people that know me know that I have a great reputation. And I'm not bragging, but I have a good reputation because I'm a solid person, I'm transparent, and really you just want to find out really what's going on and that's when your skills of communication and empathy come in hand. I like, Connie, your point that you brought up how you nurture people and that you believe in growing your staff. Mm -hmm. I think that is very important for, for staff members who do believe in that they want that mentorship, mm -hmm. that they want to be nurtured and they want that growth. So mm -hmm. I, I really liked that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very important. <laughs> yes. Okay, so those of you, uh, before you leave, please make sure you get your LEU. Um, as the instruction said, please download the file, open it. You will have to print it out and you will print, be able to print your name. You'll have to print your name. Uh, there's a blank. So just print your name and that will be your LEU for today. Also, the link uh, is in the chat box for the uh, survey and we do ask that you please fill out the survey. And again, this helps us to determine what it is that we need to improve upon and what other uh, webinars that you all might be interested in.